All right, everybody, Samori Benjamin here at City Field for Game 3 of the National League Division Series between the Mets and Philadelphia Phillies. Big game here with a special guest, former nine-time major leaguer and Philadelphia Philly and a New Jersey guy, Doug Glanville. Doug, thank you for joining me, and good seeing you always, man. Yeah, man, good to see you. Yeah, and uh, you're broadcasting this game today. You're part of the ESPN crew, of course, and great that we're in the playoffs. So what do you think just about uh, first being here for this big game three between these two rivals? Well, this is a lot of fun. I mean, personally, I grew up in New Jersey, as you mentioned. I went to college in Philly. I was a Philly fan as a kid. So I think that connection knows that this is serious, right? This is a rivalry that, first of all, hasn't happened in the postseason. And the fact that they're uh, literally punch for punch right now is no shock to me. So I'm having fun calling it, but I'm also having fun watching it as a fan and just how two great teams that are hitting their stride are going at it. Yes, no doubt about it. Okay, now I want to ask you right there real quick. So you grew up a Phillies fan. So okay. now you grew up in North Jersey. Yep. So how did you end up being a Philly fan as a kid? Well, I give my brother credit. Not that he was a Philly fan. He wasn't. But he got me into sports really early on. And at that at the time, you know, we're talking about someone who was eight years older than me. I just picked who had the coolest uniform. So I love the powder blue. I like the Denver Broncos orange crush. Uh, that was about it. So uh, Dave Cash, Mike Schmidt, Gary Maddox, Steve Carlton. And they had some good teams in the 70s, so it was a lot of fun. So. You must remember their 80 championship very vividly as a kid. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. okay. I was 10 years old, man. That was, that was it. That was, you know, and I, by the way, the Dodgers knocked out the Phillies all those years in a row. Uh -huh. And I was like, this is horrible. Yeah, they yeah. Love, you know, because I was hoping that the Phillies would beat the Dodgers so they could play the Yankees so I'd have bragging rights over my friends in New Jersey. But the yeah, Dodgers yeah. kept knocking them out. So uh -huh. that was right. It. Right, right. And uh, of course, last time the Yankees were in the World Series was 09 against Philadelphia. Yeah. And uh, and you, like I said, ended up playing for the Phillies. Just real quick, what was it like for you just to just be able to play for your childhood team as a pro? Oh, that was amazing. I mean, I think the amazing part, forget about putting on the uniform is one thing, but it's also like seeing all the legends around. These were like my childhood heroes. Like, you know, I caught the first pitch from Steve Carlton. Like, what? what? My mind was like blowing every day. And Larry Bow is my manager, and Greg Gross is my hitting coach, and it was just like Phillies brigade. So I, I loved that, and I and I loved all the old time baseball players because I played Stratomatic and was very familiar with not just the Phillies but all the teams. But it was really special to be able to see these guys every day and be really one of them. Mm -hmm. So these playoffs here, we have eight teams left. First time that each series in the NLDS and ALDS have been 1-1 after two games apiece. Yeah. Two games for all of them. So, what do you think right now? Like, which team right now do you think uh, is going to come out? I don't know, man. This is what's so crazy because it is one-one and it is so evenly matched. All these teams have shown that they have weaknesses, but they have great strengths. And uh, you know, certainly teams like the Padres, for example, had the talent on the paper, but it didn't show up for a while. And then it did. You're like, oh yeah. Or the Mets having one of the best records, if not the best record, over like a hundred-game stretch in the back half or back two-thirds of the season. So that's a, what I'm watching is like, wow, one play, one hit, one moment, and someone could end up on top. And in the best of five, a little shorter than the seven, it's all the more reason that anything can happen. Uh, we've seen that home field advantage end up being just equal for all these teams. And it might be true again this next two games and then game five. Yeah, the Phillies, two years ago, they got hot. They made the World Series upset the Braves. And then last year, they were up 3-2 in the LCS and lost at home to Arizona. The Mets now, you know, they are a team that has really looked like they have a lot of magic and uh, are playing at a level that no one thought they would. What do you think has really gotten into this Mets team that has allowed them to really, since late May, have the best record in baseball? Well, they've been able to get healthy like a lot of teams. The lead door going to the leadoff slot was a big deal. Uh, he's, he's absolutely thrived there. Um, guys coming into their own pitchers, and I say old dogs, new tricks. Manaya, Quintana, Severino, Peterson, uh, especially Manaya, like he found a new release point, he changed stuff in the offseason, yeah. and now they've become really excellent pitching. So that was a little bit of a surprise of where that was coming from, is how good their starting rotation became. And you know, so they put it all together, and look, they had the resources. It wasn't that they didn't have money to spend or be able to invest, but I think it was took time for them to 
kind of get that gel going, and, and Carlos Mendoza has been a great fit for them as a manager. You know what? We hear so much about home field advantage in all sports. Uh, and of course, now in baseball, we hear about the Phillies crowd, and you know, I mentioned how they've had some big losses at home the past couple of years in Philly. You know, so sometimes you see crowds uh, may not affect the ball player or on the negative side uh, or the positive side. But just as someone who dealt with it, being a pro athlete, do you think that home field advantage really means something right now? Oh, it does. It means something. Well, the crowd is always a positive when it's your crowd. I think the other side of that is. You do get that last at bat, and it just anything can happen. So I'll take home field all day long, but is it as much of a factor when some teams feel they can get to your bullpen or they have the confidence like the Mets have had the last few games of getting to the Phillies' bullpen? That does change things because you're not worried like, oh, they're going to bring in these arms. We've already seen them before. And these two teams known each other for 13 games during the regular season. So it's still an advantage for sure, but it's also – something that's clearly showing out to be not as big as we thought. You know what, in the American League, I'm really interested what you think about just the three American League Central teams now who are in the Final Four along with the Yankees, and those are three teams where a lot of people did not expect much from, and people even talk about how they'll, they play some of the games against the White Sox, they got wins, but you look at the playoff right now, and you know, those teams advance in the first round. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, and, and uh, you know, the Royals right now, one last night in Yankee Stadium, Detroit is doing their thing. So just how do you see like how those teams, the Royals and Tigers, no one thought anything of them, how they were able to get here right now? I mean, it's an amazing story. I mean, no one would have bet on all three teams from the Central. Uh, but you also look at, you know, because you see the Orioles and you see the Red Sox and Blue Jays and teams, with, you're like, oh, well, there's somebody else who's going to come from there. Well, who's standing is the AL Central. Uh, teams that, you know, like Royals fundamentally sound, you know, Bobby Wood Jr., one of the best players in the game. You think about good pitching, defense, base running, you know, some of the small ball components that they've been able to capitalize on. Uh, Tigers are like a miracle story because they were – they were like, okay, we're going to get rid of these veterans and see what happens next year. And these young guys who are just getting evaluated, let alone in the lineup, they showed out. And, and they're still doing it. So that's the beauty of baseball, though. You just you really don't know uh, who's going to come together and, and figure it out in such a short period of time. You don't know. I've seen so many teams who on paper and who had superior regular seasons coming to the playoffs and get knocked off. Like We've seen it so many times now. Yeah. And I think about the Yankees, even them, like since... They won their last championship, and well, since they attempted one in 2000. After that, you know, they went to the 01 World Series, and then like since 02, they got knocked off a lot uh, in the early rounds. They won in 09, but you know, only had one championship since uh, they won in 2000. You know, the 09 championship, but they've been in the playoffs pretty much every other year. But they get picked off so many times. Uh, but you know, so it's really yeah, definitely uh, hard to predict. But you know, yourself, you had some playoff action. I know 03 with the Cubs and. You even got a game-winning uh, triple and extra innings when you were with the Cubs against Florida. So what do you remember, Jess, uh, about you know your playoff experience and all that? Well, you know, 03 was my only playoff experience, at least in the uh, major leagues. Uh, it was memorable, man. I mean, I, I loved it. It was high energy. It was stressful. It was exhausting. But it was also just a chance to do something great and be part of history especially with the Cubs that at the time had lost, you know, 100 plus years in a row and hadn't won anything. So that was something that was really special. And I always remember, you know, playing for Dusty Baker and these you know, great teammates that you always will think about when you think about what it took to finally try to get to the top. And we fell short in game seven of the, the NLCS against the Marlins, which was a great team. But um, I, I was enjoying that ride, and that stays with you. So I think of the playoffs, and I know how magical it is. Now, you played at a time when that was really in my wheelhouse in terms of being a baseball fan. In the 90s, early 2000s, where there was so much talent, a lot of offense going on, a lot of uh, just supreme players. What was it like for you to just play during that time uh, with so much talent? Yeah, I mean, well, there's some great players. We also had a lot of problems with, with PEDs, so that, that was a little yeah. bit of an aspect of, like, playing in that era. But um, but at the same time, you know, there's some monumental, historic things happening, whether it's home run records, and, and that was exciting. And, and I think there's the game was going through a lot with the strike and the looming questions around unions and negotiations. 
So I do remember a lot of that, of that because I was a union rep for the team. And so there was the challenges about, well, are we going to play? And are people going to come back and watch the games? And all these questions. But I know that there was historically some, you know, guys who put up some great numbers during that period of time. And uh, it was very competitive to face some of these great players. And, uh, and so from there, I really feel good and proud of my career. It's like, glad I was able to play almost nine years and make the most of it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's very, you have to be very fortunate and a little bit lucky to be able to make a career work. Got a couple more for you, but to your point, you know, cause the steroids era, the PD thing, you know, I look at it and like I said, growing up, that was a time when I watched so many great ball players. I really enjoyed that era. But then looking back on it, I'm like, oh man, you know, I feel like a lot of that was like ruined just because of, you know, the PED use, you're not sure who was doing what. But uh, as a player at that time, you know, like, I know you all, you know, there was no steroids test, so you all knew like there were some guys using whatever. As someone who was not doing it, how did you all feel knowing that some of your competitors were using it and was giving them an advantage when, you know, it was, you know, a negative impact for you because you all are competing against each other, you know? I mean, very upset. I mean, people are enraged, uh, you know, irate, you know, whatever word you want to use. And, but you didn't know where it was coming from, how many people, you didn't want to falsely accuse people. Right. So it was, it was like this kind of ghost in the room. Yeah. And um, so it you know, went on and we tried to address it, ultimately did address it in like policy. But uh, by then, you understand the stakes were so high, those environments that are hyper competitive will create people to cut corners or do whatever it takes, so to speak. To, uh, to be, you know, great, so to speak, not, at least in the numbers game. So, uh, but like I said, you didn't know where it was always coming from, and you don't want to rush to judge as to who was doing what. I think that's what made it so difficult to wrap your arms around it, like, well, what's actually happening? And a lot of times when scandals like that happen, they take years to unravel, if they ever unravel, right? There's always players that are going to do certain things to, to win. And if it's not PEDs, it's something else. But at the same time, you know, the game has made some adjustments to try to at least address it as best they can. Yeah, and it would seem like, as a player who's not using it, it would be very frustrating. But, you know, as a fan watching, at that time, I swear, like, fans were not even aware because I guess fans thought, you know, there was a steroid test. Assume that, so no one really thought anything of it until the Balco bus came. Then everybody was like, oh, wow, there's no steroid test. That was when the public, I feel like, first knew uh, so, but it's interesting to me because you say even though some players were upset, you all still, um, you know, did not publicly call anybody out. Which I guess you know, for you all, you all didn't you know want to call anybody out publicly. But interesting that you all were very upset about that internally. Do you think the media knew much? Because no one in the media really said anything about it. You know, I think they were learning it, and, and we had to get an education about what was legal and what wasn't legal. So there was that, or not so much legal, but you know, it was a legality and and also like part of the policy of the sport and drug testing. And you wanted to get the evidence first before you said, oh, everybody's using it. So I think that was reasonable. Uh, but it seemed like it was slow moving at that point to address a, a real big problem. And so, you know, you have to do your inf get your information. And, and uh, it took a while to do that. And meanwhile, you don't know who did what, or you know some people, but you're never going to know everybody. Yeah, my last thought on that, uh, you know, I, I feel like, if someone in the media would have just wrote a column or said, hey, fans, by the way, there's no steroids test in baseball, I think fans would have been like very suspect of a lot of guys from that point on. But like I said, I don't think fans really knew there was no steroids test until the Balco bus. Like even, you know, 98, like people now, they have revisionist history, like, oh, we, we all knew they were on steroids. But at that time, there was no fan thinking, oh, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, right, it took yeah. a while to catch up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and the information yeah, was, yeah. was new, so. Yeah. I understand that. Anyway, okay, last two. Okay, so the Yankees, you know, they're 1-1 right now. If they lose to a team that's only been in the playoffs twice the last 38 years before this year, it would be a really bad look for them. What do they have to do to avoid disaster? Well, you know, it's baseball. I mean, I don't think the Royals are, like, that much less than the Yankees. These are great teams. But um, Judge has to get hot, you know. Pitching has to hold up. And, uh, and the rest of the lineup has to set the table for Judge and Soto. Last one for you, Doug. Who's the most talented player that you've ever played with? Uh, ever played with? I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. Uh, talent, just like raw talent. I mean, I played with all those Texas Rangers guys. Uh, 
Um, a lot of those guys are pretty talented. Juan Gonzalez, yeah. you know. Fudge. Yeah. yeah uh, so a lot of the Rangers just yeah. pretty much slap up that whole team. <laughs> at least they put up the numbers, I'll say that. Yeah, pa yeah, 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 yeah. Palmero, A Rod, Gonzalez. Those guys, I was like, wow. It was so fun to watch. And, and then, then yeah. Brad Roland, Schilling, yeah, Jimmy yeah, Rollins, yeah, yeah. Hutley. Got you, got you. Brian Howard. Got you. All right. Doug Glanville, former major leaguer, nine years, University of Pennsylvania alum as well, ESPN broadcaster. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, we're back.